Wonderful. Thank you so much, Will. And hello, everyone. It's so great to see all of you. Thank you for attending our presentation today. Myself and Peter, we are going to be going through and giving you a top 10 ideas for where we are thinking about for everything with the future of online learning. I'm going to take this, the first half, and then my colleague Peter is going to take the second half. And then at the end, we'll do a bit of everything as far as for QA goes. Peter, that sound good to you? Yep. Thumbs up. Awesome. Let's rock and roll. So what's so funny about this entire presentation, by the way, folks, is that whenever we're thinking and talking about the future of online learning, it's always like, oh, yes, let me go get my crystal ball that I've magically hidden from my desk. And let me tell you about the future. Yet at the same time, there are so many different types of ideas that people are doing today in the world, but it's just not mainstream yet. So it feels like the future. So many of the things that we're going to be talking to you about today, are actually ideas and actions you can take right away for your courses, your programs, your trainings, and whatever it is you're coming in for to learn all about. And that's what's so fascinating about some of these talks. Some of them do feel like they are light years away, yet at the same time, they're not so far away in the future. Now, whether you're coming at this from an instructional design perspective or from a professor perspective or from somebody in training, L&D, corporate, whatever it is, Anyone is able to benefit from all the different types of items that we're going to be getting into today. And I just wanted to let you know about that as well, since so many of us come from different types of backgrounds. So let's kick this off with my first item, which is thinking once again about the learners and their mentality. Everything that we have gone through so far over the last couple of years has been absolutely crazy and has dr uh, drastically shifted our worlds and especially the online learning experience. And what I am predicting and thinking about more is going back to the students and the learners themselves and thinking about their perspectives and really above all else, just trying to think and act once again like a human being. I feel like everything that we have gone through as far as for Zoom and other different types of uh, tools and platforms have kind of changed how we've interacted with one another. But at the same time, we need to think about the fact that without the learners, there is no program. There's no course or degree or goals. We need them above all else to make sure that what we're trying to do actually has a purpose. And I started to do this for my own courses was to think about their mental well-being, knowing that everything that we've gone through from COVID, job loss, uh, loving, uh, losing loved ones and whatnot, and at first, I just started to ask my students about a couple of years ago um, when the entire pandemic started, I just asked them to be able to tell me about how they're doing. And I incorporated learner check-ins inside of these courses themselves. These could be either written or for a video submission. And just simply just asking, how are you? Tell me about your week. What's going on? And at the same time, talking about the course material, were there any surprises? Did anything um, become more relevant for you as you started to dive on in a bit more? And of course, what questions do you have for me? As we started to do this, there was certainly a learning curve because it was kind of a bit different and it was a little bit of a awkward moment at first because inside of this online course, you're asking me, how am I doing? But eventually everyone started to catch on for trying to go about with this method. What I saw from the results from doing it over a couple of years now is that this has absolutely transformed the way that I make relationships with my students in an online learning fashion. As their instructor, I want them just to know, but I am here for them. I am not just a person behind a computer screen. And I do want to talk with them and try to figure out how I can best support them in their endeavors for their education. And they've come to me and they started to open up far more than I've ever anticipated before, talking about their struggles and what they're going through. Maybe they just lost their job. Maybe they're working the opposite. Maybe they're working 80 hours a week and they can't keep up. Or maybe they just landed a new job and accepted a career. Perhaps they accepted a new position, or perhaps they are going to be talking to me about their uh, paper that they feel like they just crushed and they did so awesome on, and they wanted to talk about it. It removed the barrier. We were able to not have something in between us from this online world that just felt like it's always kind of been there. And being able to do this, it made a less of a hesitation as far as for them reaching out to me if ever anything occurred or popped up. And at the same time, I now had this world of of insights as far as for saying if I am looking at somebody and trying to um, see them in the grade center, 
And I'm like, oh, why didn't they do the discussion this week? Oh, that's right. We're currently going through this monumental thing that would have never known about unless if we were able to communicate back and forth with one another. Now, if for everything that's happened with COVID-19, I can't forget about the fact that when it comes to mental well-being, I know that all of us, not just students, but even just us, all 52 of us currently on this call, is that Zoom burnout is absolutely a real thing. We've been on camera for so long. It's starting to really feel like second nature, but sometimes you're like, I really just don't want to be on camera today. And the idea around that, that I think we are going to be going into in a new direction has been coming from the trend, which has been brought up by VTubers. Now, if you don't know what a VTuber is, I don't blame you. I've never heard of it until someone told me about it. And I was like, oh, wow, that's interesting. VTubers are YouTubers who don't want to be on camera. Yet many of them are finding successful ways and trying to get thousands upon thousands of subscribers. And I thought about this and I was like, this is where we're going when it comes to different types of things with Zoom, hosting office hours and things of that nature. Is that students can use different types of platforms to build an avatar for them to make them feel feel not as awkward constantly on camera. And it's something that they actually have been looking forward to because it's kind of funny and fascinating, bringing some humor into the classroom, depending upon what they choose to do. Now you can look into this as far as with Ready Player Me or for Face Rig. These are both options you can literally do right now at the end of this call if you really wanted to. And I went in and I designed my own. So that's what you're currently seeing on the left-hand side of the screen. At this point in time, now it needs a much bigger beard that was at the start of the pandemic. But then over on the right-hand side, there's a little kind of raccoon. That's just kind of fun and cutesy. So whether it's going to be a 3D version of somebody, like an actual real copy of themselves in an avatar form, an anime character, a cartoon, to an animal, whatever it is, I think that this is what we are going to be doing to try to fight Zoom fatigue and to add a whole new level of element when it comes to student presence, because that at the end of the day, as an instructor, I just care that people are showing up and that they're involved and engaged and active. And that's what I'm looking for when I'm trying to be able to teach my courses. Now, something else that I need to absolutely talk about is peer-reviewed assignments. You may call these peer-reviewed activities or assessments or anything else, but at the heart of the matter, what this is, is that for adult learners specifically, adults have told me time and time again from my research that they want to be able to work with one another. They want to be able to network with each other. That is why they were taking an online program as an adult. But what's funny is that they all absolutely hate group work. So what is the solution to this? To me, it is peer-reviewed assignments. This is when one student is able to submit their own assignment, and then in a queue, they're then able to get another type of assignment, which therefore they're put into the driver's seat, and they have to be able to either grade this with a rubric, provide feedback, give guidance, support, whatever it is, and then keep on doing this until they haven't all been met. Now, what's so funny about this is that we keep on asking students to think with more of the types of human skills and interaction, but we don't really try to do so many opportunities inside of the coursework. Typically, it's focused more on the subject matter, but this is a way for us to combine the subject matter while at the same time focus on human skills that every employer is begging for, like critical thinking, decision making, and problem solving. So this is what it actually looks like. And I just went and grabbed a quick snapshot over from EduFlow, which you can actually see if you want to just Google uh, EduFlow peer review, you're going to see the exact same screen that I'm currently sharing, in which you are going to be choosing what kind of assignment and activity someone is going to be doing, a video, a uh, presentation, uh, or a paper, something along those lines. And then it's going to kick back over to another student within the classroom. And then they can go highlight, comment, add in different sections and everything that you're currently seeing on the screen as well. Now, I started to do peer-reviewed assignments a couple of years ago. And one of my courses at MIT, what I found, which was so funny, this keeps on happening. But this one story I'm about to share just like completely knocked my socks off seeing it happen in real time is that there was a course that was talking about a manufacturing problem. Now, there were two different learners who were inside of this course taking this unbeknownst to one another, but they actually worked at the same company yet in different locations. Because of the peer-to-peer -peer type of activity, they submitted the assignment. The other learner happened to get it, was reading it, and was like, wait, 
We're trying to solve this right now in my organization. They end up connecting on the discussion board afterwards, come to find out all these different types of similarities came about on the discussion board. And then other learners who are working from different manufacturers were talking about how they would approach the problem, how they would solve it, and perhaps uh, if they already did solve the problem, what they did and what they can learn from the experience themselves. So being able to bring together learners in a brand new different type of capacity is something that I've found for them to truly enjoy because they care so much about the feedback from one another. They care about being able to relate to somebody at their level. They still care about the instructor's feedback, don't get me wrong, but being able to have that peer-to-peer -peer feedback has just been so incredibly helpful. All right, number three is extended reality or XR. This is probably what you were thinking about when coming to the presentation, talking about the future of everything when it comes to online learning. And I can't blame you. This is pretty cool. And it's really interesting to see where we are going in the future with XR. If you are not familiar with the term XR, by the way, because there are so many different types of terms out there when it comes to AR, VR, MR, and then now I'm throwing at you XR, think of XR as the overarching umbrella to everything, but it's connecting a virtual space as well as a physical presence putting them together. And that's what's going to be something that is so brand new and revolutionary with everything we're going to be talking about. Now, from my research, I have seen different types of things as far as for being able to take XR and use this inside of a classroom with enhancing the learning experience, to use it and train people as far as for within the workforce and not just on the job training, but also where we are actually going to be working with everything for remote life and what is this going to become in the future. Now, to give you a couple of different examples of how this has been used, at the start of everything with the pandemic, it made a tremendous spike in students who wanted to go into med school, which is wonderful. However, when <laughs> we tried to do this, and then, oh no, everything shut down, well, what were they going to do to teach them? And one school in particular was trying to think about the module that was all about cadavers. Clearly, very difficult thing to do when you're trying to do this in a remote world. So what are you going to do? What they came up with is that they took all of the cadavers, they uploaded them into a virtual space, and then equipped them with QR codes. So that way, when students went to individual cadavers and scanned the QR codes from there, what ended up happening is that that cadaver's organ that they were going to be looking at popped up in a virtual way and also in a 3D printed type of feel. And being able to do this was so different because it gave this unique sense of understanding this particular cadaver, this particular organ, and how everything does function and come together. Now, the school is currently still using this despite the fact that we are not in lockdown anymore, but they found this to be such a great way to do this introductory type of material. And the feedback from students were so positive that they're continuing to still use this. No, that was just in the course itself. But now I want to talk more about the workforce. Before I start, does anyone actually know what this is from? Just go in the chat. Give me a quick yes or a quick no. And I'm very curious to see your response because as I was telling Peter at the beginning, this was something that I made an update to the presentation on this morning as I was watching YouTube videos about it and was like, oh my gosh, if I don't talk about it in the futuristic presentation, then I'm just going to be completely missing the boat. So it looks like I think only two of you said yes. So let me explain folks, if you have been following the news and seeing what's been happening on Facebook, I would like to officially welcome you into the metaverse. This is what Mark Zuckerberg and his team behind Facebook are thinking about when it comes to transforming the workforce. They want to be able to take somebody within the physical world and to replicate it as best as humanly as possible into the virtual space, allowing you to feel like you're really in an office and working together with one another. 
Now, what's funny is that this picture, it really does remind me of a classroom. And I can easily see this transforming the way that we are teaching online for either amount of sessions or for entirely presenting in a very different and unique way. Now, what's so interesting about this is that here is how it gets set up. You actually have to scan in your desk. The desk gets uploaded to an Oculus, which you are currently seeing on the screen. You use a keyboard that connects to the Oculus. And then at the same time, you are able to sync your laptop or your computer to the Oculus itself. So in theory, you don't need to leave this virtual world when it comes to working. This is what it actually looks like. As you are seeing on the screen, there is a virtual desk that has been scanned in below uh, the wording for the source. And that actually white bar is where the keyboard is. And then on the screen itself, you can actually see the laptop screen that this person is looking at. And then beyond it is the virtual background. Now, they've been able to test this out. This is what they are currently working on and trying to promote. Hence, also the name change that Facebook is trying to currently do literally as we speak. But this is what they envision is trying to be able to have people working from different countries come together, but still being able to move in this type of a virtual world where you can actually see people pointing and moving around, changing chairs, getting up, going to a whiteboard. That is all possible within this space. And what they are trying to do from the gist of everything that I've been getting from this is that they want to transform remote working into a permanent way of working remotely differently to still have that sense of culture and people and being together. And this is something that I am super curious to see where we're going. Mark Zuckerberg is saying about a couple of years from now, but uh, prototypes look pretty successful to me. So we'll see, but this is definitely going to change online learning for sure. And speaking of an Oculus, I have done this before within some of my courses as well, where one of them that came to mind was a course that I developed on cybersecurity. Working with the multimedia team, we filmed up and down the halls of the campus, and then we specifically focused on trying to be able to record the office furniture and the desks and the monitors and everything like that. Now, we did this for a reason, because in this session of the course, we were talking about how when people think of cybersecurity, they often don't think about the physical threats that actually come about, where quite often the easiest thing to do for cybersecurity and stealing information is that you just steal someone's junk drive or you hack a laptop that somebody didn't lock on their screen and you were able to get in without using a password. So we did this with a virtual type of a helmet where they were able to go in, see this, look around, experience it, but it was all based upon the real world setting. And the feedback at the time, this was years ago, was that it was getting there, but it still wasn't quite ready yet. And this is also when obviously we were talking about mm, 2017, I think is when I did this. So it has been a while, but now if we were to go back and approach it and trying to do it with the technology we have at hand, this could easily be something that would be helpful for trying to be able to have more of that on the job training or to be able to think more about developing from a professional skill set and that type of level. Now, number four, I want to tell you about is an additional resources section. Within online courses and trainings and programs, there exists a world that unfortunately gets filled with clutter as far as for anything that a subject matter expert or a professor or anyone else says that like, oh, this would be really beneficial to students, but it's not required. So we're just gonna put it in the optional section. And unfortunately, this becomes like a wasteland of just a thousand things of resources that no one ever reads, but it does exist. With everything that has happened with online learning and how students and learners are becoming smarter and smarter, we need to adapt. We need to be able to provide realistic and relevant timing for our materials. And the additional resources section is where we can make that happen. Now, what I'm talking about are blogs, podcasts, YouTube videos, eBooks, and certificates, which I'll get into that one in a little bit, because it's interesting to think about what we can do with that. But to give you an example, let me talk about podcasts. Millions of people listen to podcasts. Why aren't we incorporating them into our courses yet? I still can't figure out why this is a slow trend. I've been doing this for years now, and this is what I have found to be incredibly helpful for adult learners and even for those in college and, and even younger, because everyone really listens to a podcast nowadays. 
is that with one of our programs on leadership at MIT, what I found from doing exit interviews and from talking with learners is that they were telling me they wanted to become more engaged with the content, but they didn't have time. And after talking with them, we were able to uncover that they did have time, but it was actually in their commute when they went to work. That was their 45 minutes to an hour sweet spot where we could put something in there and they would be willing to give it a try if it meant helping them with the learning experience. So we did. We came up with a podcast that had a podcast episode per course that synced up with the information. It still talked more about additional parts that we just simply could not fit in and gave it a type of a unique spin to make it an enjoyable podcast series to listen to. And ended up getting thousands of downloads and adults wanted to have even more. When I found out that this was working was when they were going into the discussion boards and they were asking me about when's the next episode coming out. And I was like, well, there's no more next episodes. We're done. So it was something that was just so fascinating to see that it caught on like wildfire and we could have kept on going with it and doing this for really any other program that we have, which is my plan and hope to do so with every program. I want to be able to make a podcast series that accompanies it to enhance the learning experience even more. Now for the courses that I teach, what I keep on seeing with one marketing course in particular is that I have students who come into the course and they're coming into this course with wanting to be able to be a marketer for an organization. That is very different from being a marketer where you are an entrepreneur and you want to be able to market your own brand. What always happens every single semester is that I get half. I get half who are entrepreneurs and a half who are actually there to learn about it from an organizational level. Now, it was made for the organizational level. It was not made for entrepreneurs. So what I was able to do was that I wanted these students to hear a perspective of somebody who is an entrepreneur and then to talk about what exactly they did in a certain type of circumstance. So what I did is that for every single module, I found a high quality podcast episode where someone from an entrepreneur world was interviewing another entrepreneur and they talked about the content for that week to show alignment across the board. So in week one, if we're talking about SEO, guess what? We're gonna have an entrepreneur talk about SEO. Week two, we're talking about building a mailing list. Same thing, I'm gonna have this as well and give it to them. What I found is that all of the learners actually listened to it because they were so curious to hear about it from both different perspectives. And then by doing that, I kept on getting feedback like Dr. Hobson, this was so great. I had no idea that even being an entrepreneur even existed for some of them. And then for others, they're like, actually, maybe I don't want to do this. It sounds like a ton of hard work, not so much of a guarantee. Maybe you want to go and try to pivot. So it's really interesting to hear, but not only this change about their uh, perspective and their mindset around the course content, but also about their career and what it is that they actually wanted to do. Now, my last point on this as well, which I mentioned before, is talking about certificates. If you have somebody's attention and they are willing to give you their time, why on earth wouldn't you capitalize as much as you possibly can when it comes to their knowledge, when it comes to the learning experience? And that to me is where certificates come into play. Because when I'm thinking back to years ago when I went to college, I would have loved to have earned certificates before I obtained my degree, which took me four years, if I had something that I could stack with that along the way and show my achievements to a potential employer, it is an absolute no brainer. And that's what some organizations are currently doing. They are stacking the certificates to align with the course content. So that way, when the student is done with the eight week course or a 16 week course, then they're going to be able to not only earn the fact that they completed this course, but they also are going to be earning a certificate. This goes for anything as far as her with certificates from Google, Microsoft, PMP, cybersecurity. There's a million different types of uh, certificates you can look into that for some of them are free. Some of them you can try to adapt and change and mold into what you want to do to have it align more to the content and vice versa. But this is just an absolute win as far as for the students themselves to be able to earn something to then show to an employer that they actually did go and crush this and they did amazing. And it's not just about grades, but also about certificates and the knowledge that they accrue along the way. And then finally, before I turn this over to Peter, and this is something that I could easily talk to you about for an hour, so I'm going to just make it very brief and short, is that you must become flexible with your courses 
and your programs. Because if you don't, another organization is doing this and they are going to win over your target population. It's just as simple as that. And what I'm talking about for flexibility is to be able to provide different pathways for students within the courses themselves. Think about it when you start any kind of game, you set the level, are you a beginner? Is it intermediate? or as an expert. Why can't we do that for courses where we set tracks for them that align to specific content or a certain amount of designated weeks? The beginner level gets four weeks, intermediate gets eight, even longer gets 12 or 16. And every time that you achieve a certain part, you get a certificate for that uh, milestone, that goal, and then you move on to the next. If you're realizing that it's too hard for you, well, you can change the difficulty setting and adapt and change into a different type of track. Now, this absolutely goes hand in hand with competency-based education, as well as thinking about in comparison to what we are currently doing within our own courses and programs in much of higher education. And for those of you who don't know about competency-based education, think about this as demonstrating your knowledge compared to actually measuring and assessing as far as for how long somebody is in a seat. So it's more about knowledge versus time. And once again, if you have a learner, whether an adult or a kid, if they are willing to dedicate, you know, 20 hours over the weekend to work on their craft, why would I stop them? Why would I block you from achieving and doing more? Yes, I can understand the point of being like, oh, no, they're going to go and learn about something and might be confused and we're going to need help. But I would absolutely argue for the opposite of letting them go and try to be able to test that just like in the real world and see how much they can do and then to support them from there. So thinking about this from a self-paced perspective, does it make more sense to be able to open all of the content at once? Is that what they want? Because they should decide the pathway, not you. Or do they want something that's more instructor-led, where they want to have those weekly office hours and webinars, and they need the content to be gated because that's what they prefer? Let them decide, let them pick, let them own their own learning path, and they're going to become happier. And absolutely, they're going to want to be able to participate far more if they're able to choose and to do this. Peter, that is all I have. I need to be able to stop sharing and then to let you pick it up. Sound good? Uh, Peter, are you there? I am I am here. I just couldn't get to the mute button. Ah, there you go. Here, I'm going to stop okay. sharing for you. Okay, great. Wonderful. You're always a tough act to follow. Um, so uh, I am going to uh, talk. Um, and like Luke, I could talk for a long time on these things, but I'm going to try to keep myself to no more than... 20 minutes because I want to leave the last 10 minutes for the, the best and most fun part for all of us, which is Q&A. So I'm going to talk about the five things that I think going forward we should be thinking about to build upon what Luke said. So if you give me a second here, let me do a screen share. Here we go. So the five things that I'm going to talk about briefly are micro learning, um, AI and education, uh, informal learning networks, uh, short simulations, and learning analytics. Um, so let me, so in terms of micro learning, what does that typically mean? Um, it means a piece of learning content that can be consumed in no more than five minutes. Now, one of the things that Luke touched upon towards the end there um, is the issue we have working within a, a learning paradigm model that in many ways is outdated or an extremely limited in its flexibility. Flexibility really is the key word. We have a model of learning which focuses on a four-year degree. Why four, not three or five? Good question. Um, with summers off for many people. Um, a model which was built when many people had to go onto the farms and, and clear crops. Um, we have a lot of practices that we've been doing, not because they're useful, but because we've just been doing them for a very long time. And so we really need to re-examine how we do things, particularly in light of the technology and tools that we have available that weren't really available 10 or 20 years ago. Micro learning as a quick, short <clears throat> attempt to master information or content is something we're seeing currently more in workplace learning. But I think it can really be applied to uh, academic learning environments as well. You know, I live in the greater Boston area and 
whenever I'm on public transportation and I'm seeing college age students or even high school students on their phone, and I'm just thinking to myself, that's such valuable real estate, that, that mobile device and education generally has not come up with a really good strategy for using it. And I get to see some really good apps being used to either build upon the learning that's going on in the formal school settings or independently. You're beginning to see some development, um, but it's not quite there yet. But, you know, the model that we're accustomed to is the macro learning, which is, you know, months long time. Um, and, uh, you know, micro learning is about short concentrated activity and it can involve any, any mixture of content, uh, mixture, uh, I'm sorry, mixing. I think one of the most important aspects of micro learning is not so much in terms of learning, but the potential is greater in terms of retrieval. One of the biggest problems in learning that I do not think we've ever sufficiently tackled is um, the decay of knowledge. How many people here have devoted large amounts of their time and money to studying a subject only to have much of what they learned significantly decay within four to six months? How many of you have that experience? You know, just go ahead and put it in the chat. I'd be curious to see what your answers are. Yeah, a lot. Yeah, mm -hmm. yes, yeah, yeah, yeah. Ask me about ask me about algebra. Yeah, I know, I know. And yet, and yet, when you think about the amount of time we invest in formal learning, and how little effort we put into maintaining what we learned, it's really appalling. It reminds me of a statistic in the United States where, at the beginning of the 20th century. If you looked at public health data, the average life expectancy was 50 years. Now, if that were the case today, it would be a cause of public panic. But it wasn't at the beginning of the 20th century because that's the way it had always been. And people just kind of accepted that. And I think we have a similar problem with um, information retrieval in terms of knowledge. And um, we just kind of accepted it as something we have to live with. We don't have to live with it. We know how to um, keep information and knowledge fresh um, and routine, even when we're no longer in a formal learning environment like a classroom. Um, for example, if I am studying a subject like sociology or um, um, supply chain management, and I'm done with that course and I'm moving on to other courses, I should be able to subscribe to a service which every, you know, during time-spaced er time, um, opportunities sends me a text that generates a link to a scenario where I have to apply that knowledge. And I make a selection and either I indicate that I correctly applied it or I didn't. And if I didn't correctly apply it, it indicates you know, you know, what I need to refresh myself on. So that helps keep my, my knowledge fresh. And just as importantly, it collects rich data on what aspects of knowledge within a course decays more rapidly which then can be shared back with instructors to um, retinker their course design. I think that sort of information design loop is essential and what's missing right now, but we have the potential to do it. So one second here. So moving on to uh, the other topic I wanna to talk about, next topic I wanna talk about is artificial intelligence. Um, it's a term that's thrown a lot around these days. And I wanna start with a simple, um, pretty common definition, artificial intelligence it's a simulation of human intelligent processes by machines, especially computer systems. In other words, when we talk about artificial intelligence, we're talking about a machine doing something that previously we thought was solely the domains of human beings. So how does this play out in learning? Well, there are two areas of AI that have particularly rich opportunities. One is called NLP, which is natural language processing which would be getting the machines to respond and interact with human beings uh, in a way that only human beings were able to communicate with previously. And this often is applied to tools like chatbots. Now, what are some of the ways in which um, AI has been applied recently to learning endeavors? Well, um, natural language processing, um, again, strives to get machines to understand and respond to either text or voice data in much the same way humans do. 10 years ago, this would have sounded very science fiction. Again, may I ask, how many of you 
on a, on a routine basis, talk to a machine or listen to a machine speak to you, whether it's a GPS in your automobile, your phone, or whether it's Alexi or Siri or anything like that. How many of you do that regularly or know people who do that regularly? So think about that for a moment. We've already integrated this technology into our other aspects of our lives, um, but we haven't sufficiently applied it to its possibilities within learning. Well, how can we do that? Well, I wanna give you a few concrete examples. I started out my career in education as a teacher of writing. Um, I was an English teacher. One of the most difficult challenges for people who teach English is when they get student documents to read and assess. Um, a language artifact is typically complex and requires a nuanced feedback, which requires both reading, consideration, analysis, and writing, which means that the feedback from a human instructor is going to take a considerable amount of time. And many um, writing instructors that I know teach um, four or five classes of students. So you're dealing with over 100 students a semester. It's very difficult to get students the sort of feedback that they need in terms of the quality and the timeliness when you're solely rep replying upon a, um, a, a human individual. It would be better if, to, at least to some degree, the, um, the aspect of responding to student, student writing um, could be taken up by a machine. Now, previously, this was considered impossible unless you're talking about something very rudimentary, like a spelling or grammar check. But the evolution of AI over the past five or six years <clears throat> is such that we're getting closer and closer to a point where a machine can um, assess a paragraph or several paragraphs of human writing and give to a large extent, if not perfect, some meaningful feedback and direction. And it can do this within minutes of the human being submitting the writing. An example of this would be the start of ECRI, which was designed by a professor of English and a computer um, science programmer um, at the University of North Carolina where you, students would submit an essay and um, they will get within a few minutes um, content analysis at the sentence level and the paragraph level. Again, when you think about the, the possibilities of this, this is incredibly exciting. Another tool that is widely used, and is, this one is free to use, is Perusal, which was designed um, in Cambridge by an edtech startup, where students will read and respond to an online text using comments and the AI will grade or assess the quality of the content um, so that the instructor doesn't have to. So the instructor can face, can, can sh and share, uh, can save her or his energy um, for more demanding higher level to um, topics or challenges. And the number of faculty across the United States who have used perusal has increased and has, has gotten very good reviews. And again, it's a fascinating example of where um, writing analytics technology has really begun to evolve. And particularly in an age when we have so many students we have to respond to in a meaningful way. And again, I remind you that when you, um, when the AI tags or responds to human artifact, it is not only responding, but it is recording the sort of problems that they see, getting very rich bodies of data. Um, one of the more famous examples of using an AI in education was the Jill Watson chatbot uh, at Georgia Tech, where for a semester, a computer science instructor <clears throat> created a chatbot, named it Jill Watson, and, and had it respond to students' questions. And the success of Jill was quite impressive. Um, not only was Jill able to respond in a very timely manner, um, to student questions, the students did not catch on to the fact that Jill was not an actual human being. So in that sense, Jill passed the famous Turing test. Jill was able to answer 40% of the questions posed on the forum and by the end of the semester. And she came up with so human that one student went so far as to ask Jill out on a date. Um, so, one second. Sorry, guys, shut my phone up. Shut my phone up here for a second. My apologies. Um, so that's an example of um, how sophisticated um, AI can become um, at the present moment. Now think about the next five years. 
If you are really interested in the topic of artificial intelligence learning, there are two writers um, that I strongly recommend uh, that you look at. One is, um, is uh, Donald Clark, and the other one is Charles Fidel. Both of these gentlemen have spent a considerable number of years um, in educational technology and applied learning science. Um, you can look them up on YouTube. They both have presentations that are very impressive. And they're the ones who can really help you catch um, the fever for really exploring potential for artificial intelligence and learning. I think in the next five years, um, we're gonna see some really impressive developments. Um, and I think we should be keeping an eye on them particularly in regards to where these tools become more widely um, used and then they can be turn, generate large bodies of data. So another thing I wanna talk about is informal learning through networks. Now we've had informal learning forever. People will talk to their colleagues around the water cooler or over coffee and share information and knowledge and skills. This has really always been one of the primary tools of human learning, but in the age of social media, um, it's been magnified by the ability of people to talk with one another um, across vast distances and times and share information to a great degree. And I know this from personal experience because I'm the founder of uh, two groups devoted to sharing um, um, professional knowledge around instructional design. One of them is a Facebook group for instructional designers, which I began in 2017 and now has about 13,000 members around the world. And another one is on LinkedIn for uh, data informed learning design. Now, the one on, on LinkedIn is slightly different from the one on Facebook. Uh, for the LinkedIn one, I really wanted to start with a group that was built upon people who were recognized experts in the field. And I knew that many people in learning scientists were interested in data-informed learning design to, to really begin designing courses around the data that comes in through learning analytics. So I created the group. and. Um, and then I sent LinkedIn invitations to probably about 50 or 60 of, of the really top people in the field of learning science and technology. And the vast majority of them said, I'm interested and they're in. So I generated a group which collected some of the best brains in the world around learning design in this one space. And it'd be very hard to find a, a single university that has this much talent in terms of where things are going. So you can imagine some of the interesting conversations that can be generated in that space which previously we couldn't. So the potential for social media to amplify informal learning is enormous. And it's something that I, I strongly recommend if you haven't already um, jumped into one, through one form or another through uh, Facebook, LinkedIn, Slack, Reddit, and by all means do so because you can find wonderful colleagues um, who are eager to share their knowledge and, and want to really geek out with you about the shared knowledge in terms of learning science. Um, that's how Luke and I met. Um, so you can see all the fruitful collaborations that can arise out of that. So another topic I want to talk about is short simulations. Now, um, I think, I imagine that you're all probably familiar with the idea of simulation for learning, but for many years, particularly early in my career, simulations were the high end thing. Only people with a lot of money could, could afford to purchase or rent um, a really um, quality um, learning simulation. I started my career in a, um, in a uh, medical college. And my office was next to the simulation lab for medical students. And I was always struck by the fact of how popular the lab was. I mean, students really wanted to go there. They weren't just told to go there, they wanted to be in there. They actually had to make a reservation to, to use it. And um, I always remember the one day I was sitting in my office and I began to hear crying. And it was coming from the simulation room. And so I asked one of my colleagues, what's going on? And she said, the, uh, the medical students are taking their final exam in the simulation room. And one of the students um, killed her virtual patient. And I actually didn't know whether to laugh or to feel bad for the student doctor. But then it dawned on me, that's one doc, future doctor who will not make me that make a mistake in the real world. And that's the moment when it really dawned on me how powerful it was, how powerful these tools were. And then I began to wonder, because in the evenings I taught developmental writing in the community college. And I thought, why is it that people only at the high end have these wonderful learning tools 
and people at the lower end don't. And I realized when I thought about medicine, the military, um, aviation, a principle began to emerge in my head. And I realized that the cutting edge of learning design is frequently located in domains where pe people are being trained to deal with existential risk. So really the, the, the coolest learning tools are gonna be always in aviation, medicine, the military, anywhere where people have to make life and decisions. That's where we're gonna stop simply lecturing people and put them in situations where they have to apply knowledge. I call this Shay's law. And again, so if you're looking for where is really the cutting edge, it won't necessarily be in an academic conference and it won't necessarily be in an, um, an ed tech conference. It'll be in a conference around a profession where people have to be able to make the right decisions. And that's where learning science and technology really gets applied in a really meaningful way. And so when you're looking to see where the future is emerging for, those are some of the things you wanna keep an eye on. Now, this is an example of a short sim, which is a short simulation, which is simply a series of interactive choices made where you're given a scenario um, and the person has to click on a choice and it leads into a series of branching um, opportunities. And you can, and it's not hard to build but it creates a really meaningful and interesting learning experience for the student. When, when we talk about learning experience design, this is the sort of thing that really comes to my mind. Um, and there are a number of tools out there which people can create short simulations. They can use H5P, and they can use a tool called Branch Track, they can use Twine, Articulate, uh, Adobe Cathery. H5P and Twine, by the way, are free. So if, you're, if you start starting out for it, then I would recommend that you use those tools. Um, this is an example of my own attempt to build a simulation for my writing students. In this simulation, students were given a writing prompt where you had to write a letter as a university, as a, as a student trying to get into a university to the dean of a program. And so they were given a series of prompts and choices. And every time they made a prompt and a choice, it generated text on the right side of the screen. And at the end, um, it generated the whole document and it gave them a score and feedback based upon tone, purpose awareness, audience, and so forth. And again, that was a way in which students in an academic subject could be using the simulation design principles. Um, Clark Aldridge is one of the really leading people in terms of simulation design and he coined the term short sims. He has a group on Facebook. So if you're interested in designing short sims or learning more about that, that's one good place to go. He also has a book called Short Sims, which I strongly recommend. Now, I wanna use my last two minutes in the area which really ties all these previous fields together, which is learning analytics, which is again, the collection of learning data um, for the purposes of understanding and optimizing learning environments. Everything we've just discussed has the ability not only to engage learners, but to collect really important data which can then be used to redesign learning experiences. And that's really, I think, the core of where, where, where we have arrived. Um, one of our challenges is that we need to start designing learning artifacts that are designed as much for data collection as they are for learner engagement. And we have to design them in a way that are not just on off, whether the participants engaged or not. We have to figure out how long does it take them to solve a problem? What sort of problems do they have? which students have the problems. If we do that, then we can get access to incredibly rich data that can inform and really revolutionize the learning experience. So we go from data analysis to action. Now in a RET sim, for example, if I had a, a, course, uh, a class of students do a RET sim simulation and I were assessing things like awareness of tone, purpose, audience, and I saw average scores for the class, um, I could say, mm, it looks like I'm doing a pretty good job teaching um, writing with purpose in mind, an okay job with audience awareness, but whatever I'm doing with tone, it's clearly not working for the, for the students. So I need to revise my, my teaching strategy right now in order to increase the student's ability to master that particular concept. That's really the potential of where learning analytics can take us. And like I said, it really wraps up everything else we've been talking about. So, from I'm gonna move on to the uh, talking person, talking chat function. Um, this is a little private joke between me and uh, Luke. We have a colleague, a dear colleague, Dr. Heather Dodds, who's an expert on, on XR. And she said she was gonna jump into this meeting and pepper us with questions. 
And we said, Heather, you can ask us questions anytime. We have a bunch of other people who only have the opportunity to ask us now. So take it away. So I'm gonna stop the share and we're gonna go to the Q&A section of, of, our, of our experience. So um, we got a couple of questions, all right. One from Lisa is, uh, would digital badges be comparable to certificates? Um, Luke, do you wanna tackle that one? I do, and please feel free to also chime in as well, because I know you know quite a bit about this too, Peter, but Lisa, this is a tough one. This is a yes and a no. So to me, I've talked with some students and they do value badges. They, they like them, they enjoy them, they share them online, it's great. For others, it's not seen in the same type of lights. But what I'm thinking about when I was talking about with stacking things was also more about too of just like at the end of the day, what skills are they really working on that they can then show to an employer that, hey, I've been working on this. I have obtained something that in your job posting, you're also talking about needing amounts of uh, Google certification required or for Microsoft or whatnot. So trying to stack that with the content itself is really where I think we're gonna be going towards to make sure that we are preparing people for jobs specifically. If I'm talking about just overall learner and student satisfaction though, with badges, then I would actually approach that a little bit different to say that, yeah, they're not, they're certainly not a hindrance by any means. People will certainly like them and enjoy them, but not to the same level, I think, as far as for an actual cert. Peter, does that resonate with you? It resonates perfectly with me. Uh, Easy you know, I think there's a lot of, I think there's a lot of potential for certificates, particularly with, you know, breaking up, uh, trying to break out of the prison of the semester um, model. Um, but, you know, and I, and I think we're still in the experimentation phase, but I, I particularly am excited by the possibility of certificates because there's, there are certain things that we need, that people need to now, and we can't, I'll give you a great example. Uh, last year, I was talking with a man whose, whose previous job had been, um, Provost for Innovation at a major state university. And for him, it would have been a dream job. He was a nationally recognized writer on innovation and learning, particularly around workforce learning. And he gave it up because one of the things that was frustrating with him is so difficult to really introduce innovative learning experiences quickly in the university of Miami. He says it takes three years for a course idea to get through um, curriculum committee. Three years. He said, by that time, a lot of that information is outdated or knowledge and things are pivoted. We are not moving fast enough. We are like higher education is like a giant battleship. And what we need are swift boats moving around quickly. Um, and a lot of institutions have not yet um, grasped that model. So that's Absolutely. The, the last thing I would comment on that too, which you just remind me of Peter, is that um, uh, Lisa, if you want to look into LSU, what they've been able to do for their stackable micro credentialing, by the way, is phenomenal. Um, to me, they're leading the way as far as you're trying to be able to change what we've always done within higher ed. So yes. I would certainly And a quick shout out to Jennifer that. Morissette from LSU, who I think is here today. Oh, very great cool. There you go. LSU is yeah. doing amazing things. <laughs> I would highly recommend looking into them. That's uh, Louisiana uh, State University, by the way, so outside correct. the United States. You know. Correct. Uh, next question is, what do you think are skills within an education that you would recommend learning because they are relatively immune to automation in the future? I have a few answers to that, but do you want to take that one first? I took the last one. I will say that I, I am skeptical about um, learning that is resistant to automate. I think any body of knowledge or skill with appropriate um, uh, foresight and thought can be applied to um, automation. Again, and I think the example of writing, writing was one of those things, teaching writing was one of the things that was a uniquely human experience. There's no way a machine beyond grammar checking was going to touch how we teach writing. Um, and there's no way, there's no way that a machine is going to give meaningful feedback to a student or novice writer. We now know that isn't true. Um, so much um, in development of machine learning has evolved so greatly over the past few years that we are no longer in that older paradigm. There is this wonderful um, video on YouTube where Google um, demonstrates their AI assistant where the AI calls up a restaurant and makes a reservation and talks with a restaurant reserver and it's a back and forth conversation, even to the point where the AI is going, 
Um, uh, yeah, I, okay, I think that time will work for us. Okay, there was no way you would have not known that, that you wouldn't have known that was an AI unless somebody told you. And I think we're getting to that point. We're gonna see the application of that high level AI in, in areas where they can pay for it, but it's gonna trickle down to education. And I think the savvy institutions are gonna realize how they can invest in that because they have to find a way of scaling up quality instruction. And they simply cannot do that with human beings. I love that. It's a fantastic answer. The only thing I'll add to that is when that happens, which is a very soon in the near future, for right now, present day, if we're talking about human skills, there is something that came out of MIT called the human skills matrix that I would look into. It's basically talking about that as far as we're talking about trying to be able to build up those critical thinking skills, emotional intelligence, conflict resolution, problem solving, things of that nature that AI isn't an expert in yet. But as Peter says, it's all coming. But you can definitely look at the human skills matrix to see a few things to help uh, answer your question. Answer done. Boom. On to the next one for Steve. Fantastic. I'm sure Steve's smarter than both of us. So this will be interesting to see how we tackle this one. Uh, Steve says, how do you feel the COVID pivot to online and K-12 has influenced their perception of college level online education? How should colleges approach their marketing and course design to connect with these experiences? Fantastic question, Steve. And I think what is so interesting to think about with all of this from everything that has gone through and online is that I'm going to assume that for these students who've gone through this transition, they're going to expect more from what we've already been doing so far from the, the college perspective, where I feel like many colleges and universities around the world have still done things in the same old way, and they haven't yet adapted to different things. So seeing and hearing about elements from um, some younger folks that I know of that were like, they're, they've been using Slack in their courses, they're using things for Discord and with Twitter and with other different elements. And I was talking the other day about just how much I enjoy and love GatherTown as far as for a type of a virtual conference platform where students are able to work with one another. And I can easily see kids doing that because it's essentially combining the graphics of Super Mario and the elements of Zoom and making people work with one another, which is just something that is just so um, fascinating to think about. So I can easily see now that they're going to say like, okay, my perception of college is that it should be just as great as what I'm currently experiencing. And if it's not, then I'm, I'm assuming that things are going to go in a very different direction or someone is going to step up to the challenge and win them all over. Uh, just like when SNHU created their own version of the academic advising model, and they started to just scoop up more and more people because they basically said, you're not alone in this online world. We will support you and we'll give you a dedicated person to help see you through all the way until graduation. And then that spread with word of mouth, like wildfire. And all of a sudden they're up to, I don't even know how many thousands of students they have at this point in time, but if they become the largest institution, as far as we're in the online world within the next couple of years or so, I absolutely would not doubt it because they stepped up to that challenge. Peter, any thoughts around that as well? No, no, I think you, you tackled it very well. And besides, I'm too scared to answer to Steve. I don't, I'm afraid that my answer will not be adequate. <laughs> <laughs> too so, funny. Um, yeah, so next question, if you want to understand the world of XR, where do I start? Well, my, my knee-jerk response would be, seek out Heather Dodds. Um, uh, that would be one thing. She is our colleague, and she is an expert in the field. Um, and, and you can see in the chat, she said, that would be me. Um, so she would be someone you would co connect with, not only to learn about it, but to tell you, um, to introduce you to the, to the tribe of XR um, folk and, and tell you where all the interesting stuff is going on. Um, there are also a number of books that are beginning to emerge on XR, but I, I wouldn't know the top, title off the top of my head. Um, XR is, is one of the areas where I'm interested in, but I have not really done a deep dive. And so in this, I'm going to pivot a little bit over to Luke to see if he can suggest any um, references. Yeah, absolutely. So I, I feel like I'm just going to keep on plugging my school, which is uh, fine because I work at the you know, the institution that does deal with technology more than most. We have our own uh, virtuality lab at MIT that has a slew of amazing resources and things for you to try out and to check out right now. And I would say to give that a shot and to look there first. 
And even honestly, just the simple things too, where if you do YouTube about XR, which is what I was doing this morning, uh, honestly, which is how I found out about what the metaverse is currently looking like, where I was like, oh my gosh, this is currently what is happening. Like this is, I, I need to talk about this today or else I'm going to be uh, old news and behind on things that you can definitely find some reputable sources there of people doing it, not just within education too, within outside, because education seems to be for whatever reason, the, the last to be able to pick up on these new trends. So just check out outside of education first would be my, my answer there. Besides MIT, we, we got to figure it out. Yeah. It's MIT. It's like, you know, as a, as anyone who can figure it out, MIT's guy. <laughs> just to always remember that's where, that's where Tony Stark went. So basically that answers the question there. Um, always. So uh, back to Steve, do you anticipate a quantum leap in a concept to be honest that accommodates many of these innovative forms um, of, of instructional communication. We haven't gone much further than submissions and discussions in the past 10 years. Yeah. Steve has really identified one of the elephants in the room. We often have these conversations about this cool technology, and then we go back into the world of, of the LMS model, which has largely remained unchanged fundamentally since the 1990s, So, which is why a lot of us had to return to that, and, and it's a bit depressing. Um, I have a little bit of hope. I've begun to see some models um, that are emerging that um, which are are being put together by people who really care about this problem and have really been thinking about it. People out of like Carnegie Mellon in the United States where they really do a lot of research on uh, learning technology. Um, and there is a, there is a company, um, Michael Feldstein is one of the leading edutech um, commenters in the United States. And he's currently working with a company um, whose name I will try to bring up um, in the next few minutes who um, demoed a very, very interesting model of really of the next generation LMS, which really addresses or begins to address um, some of the issues about being stuck in this old model because it's being built by the people who care about this problem and who really wanna see it fixed within their working lifetime. So I'll, I'll try to dig up some information on that, but I, I do believe that until we move the LMS model, a lot of these other things that we talked about won't ever truly become mainstream. The LMS, for better or for worse, is where most people encounter educational technology. And until that house is changed, then the experience of most learners won't change. But that is definitely by far when I started, um, you know, my part with talking about some of these ideas are already out there, but just haven't been implemented mainstream. And certainly, Steve, to your point, the LMS is absolutely what is holding us back. Don't, absolutely. You hit the nail on the head there where there's so many things that we can do. And I was actually talking to Heather um, uh, um, separately, where talking about just how with taking competency-based education and adding in different types of tracks within the own courses themselves, and then switching over to a different model, if you find it too hard or too easy or whatnot. And the thing is that we can do that, but it is the LMS that is such a problem that we have to overcome. And that's what I find so interesting. What I would say, though, um, to piggyback off of what Peter is saying is that once again, I think it's going to be folks outside of education who are going to be able to do more as far as for incorporating other tools. And then other folks are going to be able to realize this um, as far as for with like, oh, like we don't have peer reviewed assessments yet. Well, Eduflow does. So how can we learn to take that tool and to work with them and build it into our own and, and things of that nature? And there's some places too, where if they build their own LMS, it wouldn't surprise me. I was doing that at Northeastern with a team. We were building our own because we weren't satisfied with what was currently offered out there. And of course it took forever with time, energy, money, resources, you name it. And it still was difficult at the end of the day of, of trying to be able to get it published and launched and whatnot. But it's, it's a great question. It's really tough to say. Uh, any ideas for presenting, any, for presenting new ideas to faculty members and university administrators? I feel like I'm banging my head against the wall and trying to present, yeah. Uh, I've been in faculty development for over 10 years and I think everyone who works in higher education and learn design is by default in a fa um, faculty um, development and innovation. And um, we're swimming against the tide where the incentives are often um, not in favor of innovation, but they're in favor of the status quo. And that's the biggest problem. Many of us um, get by by encountering um, a few enthusiastic early adopters who help keep our morale up. But for the most part, education won't change um, 
and become more receptive to these things until the incentive systems change. And that's the larger conversation. I sometimes think that what's really needed is some sort of um, new post-secondary model um, instead of standalone. I, I mean, I've, I've, been, I've been working in education so long trying to change it and I've just not seen as much um, change as I want. So I'm, I'm beginning to really think about outside of traditional models. I, I call myself a, curricul <clears throat> a curricular Lutheran. Um, I just don't think I can reform the church, the educational church that I'm in. And the only way to really bring about change is for competing models to emerge um, and, and, and to some degree threaten um, the primacy of the older models. And that's the only thing that's gonna stir them out of their um, torpor. Uh, because, um, you know, when, when there aren't sufficient rewards or recognition for really going to the effort of being innovative on a large scale, then you're not gonna see innovation. What you're going to see are little pilot programs um, that flutter up for a little bit and then they vanish. That's been my experience. Um, and as my friend Donald Clark said, innovation isn't innovation if it's not sustainable. And at this point in my career, as a man in his mid fifties, I'm only interested in sustainable innovation. Um, so that's really where I tend to concentrate my energy and try to um, see where there are pragmatic solutions. And I, and again, so I totally feel. I would say to respond to your question, try to try to find um, try to find your tribe, try to find the adopters, get them together, get them to start doing cool stuff without trying to convince everyone else. Pilot the stuff, get some early low hanging fruit success, and then present it to the administration. Um, that may be one model of, of, of getting more rather than trying to convert everybody. Just find the, work with the willing, and then see where you can go from there. Only thing I would add to that, Peter, which is phenomenal, would be to then market that with the pilot program. If it's doing well and you make it real, get that thing published, put it out there on the world, tag everyone on LinkedIn and make other people start to buy into the idea and use that platform that you do have to form more champions who want to be able to give it a try. Because when they start seeing other faculty doing it, they're going to get that buy-in. That faculty is going to talk to other faculty. And then before you know it, you're going to be hosting a brand new conference talking about this tool and how amazing it is. And that's going to drive them to want to be able to consider it just a little bit more than normal. And that's also where the learning analytics will come in. Because if you're doing something that's collecting important data about student success and you have hard data to show that your students and learners are consistently doing better than people in the traditional model, that is the tool which will really can move things, I think. That's why analytics is going to be so important. It's the proof. So you got to show them. Got to show them the proof for sure. Well, I know that we are already over time. Do you want to do rapid fire for the last two questions? We'll do rapid fire for the last two questions. Is there a learning app tool that you found addictive? Um, anything that enables me to build a short simulation um, and deploy it, it is to me a great tool. I love creating simulations. I love creating experiences like that and then seeing seeing the mistakes that students make and then generating a conversation about the mistakes. So I, I fell in love with Branch Track a couple of years ago. Um, and then I started also looking at the freer tools, but anything that, that, that helps me build an interesting um, uh, learning experience that can be deployed on any um, platform, particularly um, a simulation that can run on a phone, which I think is a very important place for learning simulations. That is what I find uh, addictive. Luke. Absolutely. Uh, so I'll throw out there two. One of them is a change management simulation from Harvard. If you look up that for uh, Harvard Business School, they have a bunch of simulations that you can use and incorporate into your courses. I found that learners love them. They think it's awesome. You can build entire sections of the courses around them. They're, they're awesome and fun to do and to make people have a more involved and engaged learning experience than normal. Uh, the other one, honestly, is Slack. I have used Slack to replace discussion boards within some of my courses, and it is fascinating. It is real-time engagement with people, and they all have their phones on, so I get pinged at every minute, every hour on the hour, <laughs> depending upon what's going on, where I'm like, wow, real engagement. It's like they actually care. If we give them a platform to be able to talk about these things, then you know that's it's like what we got to do, meet them where they are. So that's it. Uh, then the final one, do you see MS Teams taking over from the likes of Moodle as a type of learning management system with OneNote and other features? That's a good question because it's also Microsoft. So I don't think so. If it was Apple, 
Yes. If it's Microsoft, I don't think so. Cause I would rather die than use a PC. I, I, I can't do it. I just, oh my gosh, I, I converted when I was 16. And ever since then, I'm like, nope, I can't use it. So I don't think they can do that. <laughs> However, I will say to your point though, uh, Lynn, about that is that if you have other different types of elements that can be uh, incorporated with like LTI and other different types of tools, you can keep on adding and building around for a platform itself so you can customize your own, then I could see that happening. Because if you're going to say that like, oh, you're going to be using and taking notes in Notion, your Slack, um, Slack is your discussion board channel. We're going to host our office hours on Gather Town, and it's in this hub and you can customize everything. I could see that taking over, but it's going to be a customized fit for your students and your needs your budget, time, energy, resources, and blah, blah, blah. Peter, go. Um, many years ago, I thought that um, with the introduction of um, Google Classroom and Google Docs and everything, that, that Google was secretly building its own LMS mm. to, to rule them all. I thought if any company could really um, change the market of LMS culture, it would be Google. For reasons that I have not yet quite understood, um, they never went that path. So I, I really don't know whether or not, part of the problem is, the education sphere isn't very sexy for the really big resource companies because we're poor um, and we can't make them a lot. We're, we, we look good when they partner with us, but we don't make, they don't make a lot of money for us. So I don't know. I do think though, that there may be interesting developments in other areas. For example, um, a couple of years ago, one of the chief learning scientists in the United States, Candace Thiel, went on a sabbatical from Stanford and went to work for Amazon. And ever since then, I've been wondering what's going on over there because you don't hire Candace Thiel just to build a better training program. I'm beginning to wonder whether or not there's some sort of Amazon secret X product around creating some really potent, powerful learning tool so they could take over the education world as much as they've done the commerce world. That's my conspiracy theory. So I don't know. I think Amazon may be a company that is in the area where they could do a lot of good or a lot of damage depending upon which way they went because they have the resources and they know data and they know consumer choices and preferences better than anyone. So I'll speaking that of that, back. speaking of that, Peter, Amazon has recently bought domains for Amazon education. FYI, if you Google that, there are some domains out there where Amazon is trying to launch their own type of website. So we'll see what comes from that. But yeah, they're going, they're going to become a thing, which they could do it. Talking about what platforms Amazon could do it. There's no competitor to them. So mm, be interesting. Be interesting. Cool. Well, we did it. Okay. <laughs> uh, uh, Luke and Peter, thank you so much. Uh, I, I think I speak for everyone when I say this was like excellent. Um, and uh, I, I can really see that the two of you get along really well. Um, when it comes to like panel chemistry, this is probably the most perfect combination that um, you could ever hope for. <laughs> this so, isn't our first rodeo. Uh, We've done this I, before. I can yeah, definitely see that. <laughs> Um, I just want to uh, quickly point everyone to to like, please uh, check out um, Luke Hobson's podcast um, uh, channel, YouTube channel, website. He's got a, an academy um, on Peter's side. Please join Peter's Facebook um, group. It is super, super handy. One of my favorite parts of Peter's Facebook group is the articles that Peter himself shares. Um, if you're really interested in staying like, you know, aware of the cutting edge stuff, just look at whatever Peter's um, posting on Facebook. It is very, very interesting. And then the discussions there um, are like amazing. Um, so yeah, thank you very much. I really appreciate um, your time and um, all of the knowledge that you've shared with us today. Awesome. Thank you all. Appreciate it. Thank you, everyone. Appreciate it so much. Cheers, everyone. <laughs>